Um, I'm delighted to see you all here this afternoon um, at, here at the Ford School of Public Policy. I'm Michael Barr. I'm the dean of the school, the Sandy and Joan Weil dean of the Ford School of Public Policy. Uh, it's just a real pleasure to have all of you here. Uh, many of you are actually watching uh, next door. We had such an incredible demand. And uh, many of you are also watching online. Uh, we're just uh, delighted to have uh, all of you uh, here. Uh, I want to welcome you to our third annual Vandenberg Lecture. Uh, which this year fe uh, features Ambassador Samantha Power, a journalist, Ambassador to the United Nations, Anna Lynn Professor of the Practice of Global Leadership and Public Policy at Harvard Kennedy School, and author of the just released book, The Education of an Idealist. In conversation with the Ford School's John Chachari, Associate Professor of Public Policy and Director of the Wiser Diplomacy Center, and coincidentally, law school classmate of Ambassador Power. <laughs> I would like to say uh, a bit more about uh, Ambassador Power in a moment. Um, let me first share why this distinguished lecture series is named for the great Arthur Vandenberg, who served the state of Michigan in the United States Senate from 1928 to 1951. Born and raised in Grand Rapids, Senator Vandenberg led the Republican Party from a, from a position of staunch isolationism prior to American involvement in World War II to a broad embrace of internationalism. As chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, he worked to forge bipartisan consensus for our country's most significant and enduring international policies, including the Truman Doctrine, the Marshall Plan, NATO, and the creation of the United Nations. The Vandenberg Fund was established here by the generosity of the Meyer Family Foundation. The Vandenberg Fund enables the Ford School to host high-profile public events on international relations, U.S. foreign policy, diplomacy, trade, and more. The lecture series serves as a vital intellectual tribute to Senator Arthur Vandenberg. We're honored that Hank Meyer is here this afternoon. Please join me in thanking Hank and the whole Meyer family for their generous support of this series. We also have a very special guest with us uh, today, the president of the university, Mark Schlissel. Uh, please join me in welcoming and thanking uh, Mark for his leadership of the school and support for our work. We're also honored uh, to be joined today, as you can see, um, by uh, the Weiser family. Um, uh, we hope uh, Regent Ron Weiser will be here in just a moment. Eileen Weiser has just walked in. And Ron and Eileen have been uh, generous donors uh, and supporters of the whole university, uh, including to the Ford School and the establishment of the Wiser Diplomacy Center. So please join me in thanking Eileen. <laughs> and now to the star of our show. You will find Ambassador Power's uh, full biography in the program. I want to highlight uh, for our students in particular that the path that led Samantha Power to become ambassador of the United Nations was not a linear one. Uh, she did not know from the time of birth uh, that she wanted to be or would be the ambassador to the United Nations. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about your uh, careers. One thread, however, uh, I think is a, a constant throughout her career, and that's been her abiding commitment to human rights. Power started her career as a journalist reporting from conflict zones, including Bosnia, East Timor, Kosovo, Rwanda, Sudan, and Zimbabwe. Before she joined the US government, she was the founding executive director of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at the Kennedy School. From 2009 to 2013, Power served on the National Security Council for senior, uh, excuse me, National Security Council for President Obama as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights. From 2013 to 2017, she served as UN Ambassador to the United Nations. As she notes in her new book, she went from being an outsider to an insider, from being a critic of American foreign policy to a leading representative of the United States on the world stage. Her commitment to human rights is still embodied in her work. In addition to her appointment at the Kennedy School, she is also the William D. Zabel Professor of Practice in Human Rights at Harvard Law School. Ambassador Power embodies the values of the Vandenberg Lecture, as well as those we hope to impart to our students here at the Ford School. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Power.
Let me, um, let me just say a word on format before I turn things over um, to, uh, to John. Uh, we'll have some time toward the end for questions from the audience. Uh, two Ford School students, uh, Brooke Bassigal and Mariana Smith, with Professor Susan Waltz, will sift through your question cards and pose them to the panel. So we're very much looking forward uh, to that. For those of you who are watching online, you can also submit questions uh, by tweeting them to the hashtag policytalks. Again, welcome, and now let me turn things over to Professor Chichari and Ambassador Power. Thank you so much, Michael, and uh, I'm delighted to be able to welcome Ambassador Power here to the Ford School, and you're going to get a taste of what's in her new book, The Education of an Idealist, as she reads to us uh, a brief passage from the book to start us off. Indeed, and before I do so, um, let me just echo the thanks that have been extended um, to Hank Meyer and to the Weiser family for supporting this, um, not just this lecture, but internationalism, diplomacy, um, uh, aspects of our society and our governance that we never thought would go out of fashion, but that ha are having a little trouble these days. Um, so to be sure that young people get exposed uh, to the array of complicated factors that are shaping uh, our world and the world that we will bequeath to our children and grandchildren, um, it's just critical, really, the support that you have offered, uh, Mr. Meyer, Mr. Weiser, the Weiser family. And then, Mr. President, I'm used to saying that in a different context, but nonetheless, <laughs> Mr. President, I know your time is extremely precious. I heard on the way over that you've got like 60,000 employees, never mind that number of students and graduate students. So the fact that you're here, I think, sends a really important signal also to the students uh, about just how important it is to build students who, um, to shape students uh, and the education of students who can um, deal with problems at home and also recognize the connection between uh, what is going on out in the world and uh, the strength and hopefully the vibrancy of our own democracy. Um, the last thing I'll say, uh, just because I could get to feel like I'm talking to the people in this room, is that I used to be one of the people who came late and was in the spillover room. And so <laughs> I just like to say hello, I'll come over and say hello, you're my people. Uh, so. Um, not to say that I was never early, but, um, but there'd be some chance I'd be in that room. Um, so what I thought I would do is, we, we're going to get into a discussion, I hope, where we talk about you know, contemporary issues. President Trump is at the UN at the present, climate, the incredible climate movement that young people are driving all around the world. Um, but I have written a book in a very personal way, um, with an eye really to appealing to um, young people, and the young at heart. Uh, those who are feeling right now um, maybe more of a pull to try to make a difference than they've ever felt in their lives, um, part of, because in part of what ails us, um, but also who may be plagued by some of what plagued me at various stages of my career, which is doubt about whether one can make a difference. And so in lieu of writing a policy book or a, a traditional government memoir, um, I tried to take advantage of the fact that I was a writer before I became a bureaucrat uh, and a government official, a writer before I became a diplomat. I tried to tell a story that could open up this world and hopefully make it um, seem as appealing, um, if complex, but as appealing to you as it, as it was uh, to me, as I've had the, uh, the privilege of, of living within it. So I just want to give you a flavor of how the personal and the political mix and how indeed inseparable they are. And uh, the, the story in this book, which maybe we'll talk a little bit about, but is that of an immigrant coming to this country from Ireland, I came when I was nine, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, the year that the Pirates won the World Series and the Steelers won the Super Bowl. So I became <laughs> a, my way of fitting in was to learn all about sports. And um, that's really what I wanted to be when I grew up. I, first I wanted to be the center fielder for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And then when that was uh, clearly not necessarily going to be available to me, I wanted to be a sportscaster. And the book tells the story of how I got uh, rerouted and started to care uh, about human rights and foreign policy and so forth. And I won't, I won't get into that. But uh, I became a war correspondent after college in Bosnia. And I wrote a book on American responses to the major genocides of the 20th century. And I will mention that that book, which is called A Problem from Hell, was one that grew out of a paper I wrote while I was in law school. 
Um, and so I just encourage you who are working on your papers and saying, what good does this do? And who am I doing this for anyway? And But to just know that the thinking you do here may well serve you later in ways you don't expect. And this paper gave rise to a five-year writing project that gave rise to getting a call from a first-term senator named Barack Obama um, who uh, invited me to initially have dinner with him and then uh, not that much longer, uh, we agreed that I would come down and work in his Senate office. At our dinner, our first dinner together, uh, I said, I'm hearing, he had just gotten to Washington, but I said, I'm already hearing rumors that you might run for president. He said, what? How presumptuous would that be? <laughs> I mean, I just got here. You know, I'd have to start fundraising like next year. That's crazy. I, you know. Anyway, the next year he started fundraising. He still launched his <laughs> presidential campaign. When he's on his book tour, you can ask him about all of that. But, um, uh, and, and, it's a, and I tell the story in the book as to why he changed his mind. Um, but I then uh, joined his campaign. And being on his campaign was the first time I'd ever really worked as part of a team. I'd always written, done my articles alone and my teaching uh, alone, although of course with my students, but to be part of that team I found immensely gratifying. This is just a short story uh, from the early days of the campaign, uh, and it's in a chapter called Yes We Can. As I worked at my computer in Winthrop, Massachusetts in the spring of 2007, I received an email that was clearly not intended for me. Cass Sunstein a University of Chicago law professor and an Obama campaign advisor had written, quote, Martha, isn't this campaign law group a disaster? <laughs> As in, worse than say anything, end quote. I had met this cast once before at an academic conference. We had struck up a lively conversation and I had learned that like me, he was an avid squash player and Red Sox fan, but we had not kept in touch. Cass had seemed almost incurably cheerful during our brief interaction, so the sour tone of his email surprised me. But since it was addressed to Harvard Law School professor Martha Minow, I deleted the message and went about my day. I soon realized, however, that I was not the only accidental recipient of Cass's private <laughs> lament. Neither Cass nor I were full-time or paid campaign advisors. We were professors who contributed policy ideas by telephone and email to candidate Obama's campaign and who spoke publicly on his behalf. Obama's staff, his core staff, paid staff, had assembled an informal working group comprised of legal scholars to inform his views on an assortment of pressing issues, including how to go about closing the Guantanamo Bay detention facility and reversing President Bush's licensing of torture. Obama, and Cass had been colleagues at the University of Chicago, where they both taught classes on constitutional law. With a possible Obama speech on the rule of law approaching, the group had produced nothing. In expressing his frustration to Minow via email, Cass had mistakenly autofilled the entire senior staff of the Obama campaign. <laughs> His criticism of the law group caused wide offense. Danielle Gray, the immensely capable lawyer in charge of domestic policy, took it as an insult to her leadership and forwarded the email to me saying, can you believe this asshole? <laughs> a friend of hers converted part of Cass's email into a large poster and hung it on the wall at campaign headquarters. The poster read, Danielle Gray, worse than say anything? <laughs> I felt for Cass. Like most mortals, I had suffered my own email mishaps. Not long before, in fact, I'd been set up on a blind date by Tom Keenan, a friend and fellow professor whom I had come to know through his research on mass atrocities. The date had not gone well. I wrote to Tom with a rundown of all I did not like about his friend, asking how he could have conceivably thought that we might get along. I stressed in the email that the incompatibilities were deep, and I signed off the email saying, quote, I think, Tom, as the old saying goes, you can only make them dress better, 
end quote. <laughs> Lovely. Um, as soon as I hit send, I heard a ping in my inbox. It was the message I had just sent, freshly delivered as an incoming email. Within seconds of that first ping, I heard a second. I'd received a note from Tom, which simply read, you didn't. <laughs> I put my head in my hands and slowly typed, I did. <laughs> Tom and I were part of a listserv of thousands of genocide survivors, <laughs> activists, and scholars. And I had accidentally sent the note savaging the blind date to the entire list. <laughs> Years later, when I was serving as US ambassador to the UN, people who had received my email <laughs> would still exuberantly quote my words back to me you can only make them dress better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I should add, for those who don't know, that I married Cass Sunstein and have two children with him now. So <laughs> there are some blessings to mishaps of that nature that you, you can't expect, and I certainly would not have expected at that point. Great. Um, that actually temporarily leads us right to where I wanted to start, which is to talk a little bit about your transition from the campaign into your first job at the National Security Council. I know a lot of students are interested uh, in the question about how your role as an activist and as a journalist fed into your role as a government official. Years later, you tweeted about a Cuban democracy activist, and the Mexican ambassador to the UN came up to introduce himself and said, you have to decide whether you're a diplomat or an activist. You can't be both. Now, you disagree with that in the book um, and reject that premise, but you do discuss at length the new ropes that you had to learn when you took your government job. Uh, in one exasperated moment, you wrote in your diary that Sudanese troops were massed around Darfur. 30,000 people were gathered at the UN base. The UN was packed up to leave, and Samantha Power, upstander, had no effing idea how to write a decision memo. You should have come to the Ford School. <laughs> But students... I was wondering how you were going to deal with the expletive. I, 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 I wasn't sure uh, <laughs> how one deals with expletives these days at, at, um, in Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> but, but really, what are some of the key uh, traits that you think you brought with you uh, as an activist coming into this government role? And what are some of the key new skills and thought processes that you had to develop to be effective at the NSC and later as ambassador to the UN? It's a great question. And... Let me start by maybe just adding a little more to the, the sort of picture of the culture shock that one encounters from going from the outside to the inside. I mean, when I first got my badge, my blue badge, to be able to go into the West Wing, which was a very hallowed badge to get, um, and I went into the Situation Room, you know, I had a kind of intruder alert going off in my head because... I had been on the outside for so many years trying to get US officials to talk to me so that I could write elaborate articles for the New Yorker or the Atlantic about what policymakers were doing and, and what the incentives were and how they were, you know, how group think worked and how individuals st stood up in those circumstances, how individuals stood by, and, and all of those dynamics that fascinated me. Suddenly I was in those meetings. Um, and indeed, I worried a lot at the beginning. I, I have developed the habit, and I, I recommend it um, to students who don't seem to have the habit in quite, to quite the same extent anymore as, as people in my generation did, but I am a copious note taker. Um, and of course, that served me well as a journalist when I was writing down people's quotes, but it also served me well in government because the more savvy and seasoned government officials learn very well how to basically re-describe what has been decided in a meeting to suit their pre-existing agenda. But I always had the notes. <laughs> um, but, you know, again, for, partly because of my journalistic background, partly because I didn't trust my memory. And, um, but, I, but early on, there were suspicions that as I took these very detailed notes, that somehow I was doing it in order to be in touch with my former journalistic friends. And so there was a kind of suspicion that I felt. I mean, probably some share of it was in my head, but some of it was real. And I had to adjust also to the lingo. Um, the way people talk in government is, no matter what you're learning here uh, at this school, it can't prepare you, particularly for the gendered metaphors, 
you know, like we'd be in a, uh, talking about a negotiation, opening up a diplomatic channel with Iran, for example. Somebody would say, you know, we gotta go open kimono into these negotiations. I'd be like, open kimono? Like, seriously? Or we gotta show some leg. It's really important we show some leg. And then the, the funniest one was because I had just arrived in the administration and I was five months pregnant, I actually heard myself say, you know, we can't be half pregnant uh, on this decision. We've got to decide <laughs> between this or that. And there I was, actually more than half pregnant. Um, so anyway, there was all of that. And I, you know, having come to America as an immigrant at, to Pittsburgh back in the day in 1979, I had then tried to learn Pittsburghese and Americanese and to lose my Irish accent and so forth. And I really felt like going into government was something similar. It's like you had to suspend certain parts of who you were, at least leave them at the door when you went in in the morning, and then master this new way of being and doing in order to be effective, which was my number one uh, objective. And the passage that you read was at a time when I was struggling to be effective. Um, so I think what I brought was uh, that I, I, I didn't change um, between the person I had been and the person in, in then these important rooms. I had the same agenda. Uh, broadly speaking, it was a human rights agenda, but beyond that it was how to be a voice at a very um, exclusive table for insisting that we think through the human consequences of our decision making. Um, and so, yes, as it happens, my primary research had been on mass atrocities, and that was a, a, a portion of my portfolio, but I was also, we were drawing our troops down from Iraq, and I was very concerned about Iraqi interpreters who uh, had risked their lives in order to support the American military, and I didn't think that the process that was focused on the drawdown, a, a drawdown I very much supported, was sufficiently focused on who we were leaving behind. And so, again, to be the voice in that room saying, well, what are we gonna do for them? How are we gonna get them visas if they still wanna come to this country? Or uh, in some way support their efforts to, to find security for themselves and their families given what they've risked for us. Um, LGBT rights was something that, uh, of course, I'd cared an awful lot about uh, in the domestic context, but also was very aware that some 80 countries criminalize being gay around the world or, or criminalize same-sex conduct, and um, there'd never been a U.S. government effort to even just in subtle and sometimes private ways to push uh, governments to treat more humanely same-sex couples in their midst. And so, you know, doing little things like creating a legal defense fund for same-sex couples that were just hauled into jail because they were gay in, in loving uh, gay relationships, or making sure that we looked at asylum claims from L persecuted LGBT people uh, in a way that meant that they, in effect, got an expedited look and, and so forth. And so that was just me. That was the me that had been outside, and now I got to be the me that was inside but I had to figure out how to find allies within the government. Um, initially, I was very stung. Michael and others, and any of you who've been in government, um, can speak to you know questions of access. Of course, loom so large, and I'd been very close to President Obama, to Senator Obama, and to candidate Obama, and he had, in some ways, helped broker my relationship with Cass, and now I was married to Cass. But suddenly, I found myself as the human rights advisor with a lot of layers between me and my friend, who is now the President of the United States, and so my, my idea of like walking into the, you know, the Oval and you know, Mr. President, you know, this is what, I mean, it just wasn't like that. It was all mediated with all these, and it's just, you know, again, not like on the West Wing, it turns out, exactly. <laughs> and, um, but just learning, okay, how do I write the paper that's going to be written in a manner that it's gonna get before him and then he's gonna write his scrawl in the margins and I'm gonna take whatever that scrawl is and I'm gonna run with it at the State Department and the Defense Department and it really didn't take long. It's like any kind of new set of rules you're learning, you figure out uh, how to learn it. But what I had to do is get over my own sense of, eh, well, you know, I don't, see my, I don't see Obama as much as I used to, uh, <laughs> to what Richard Holbrook, um, the late great diplomat said, he's like, go where people aren't. Like, don't worry about getting into a yet another meeting on, you know, precisely how many troops we're going to be sending to Afghanistan. Go fix something that nobody's focused on at the highest levels that Obama would be thrilled if you could make progress on. And where, you know, there's going to be much less interference, m many fewer people in your way. And so, you know, building coalitions around 
the less high profile issues initially became a kind of gateway to eventually then, of course, being at the table and in the cabinet and being central to the debates on the, on the even harder issues. Right. And as you go along in the book, you describe then how you participated as part of a team uh, that made a lot of progress on a wide range of issues. You mentioned one a moment ago, LGBT rights abroad, as well as at home. Uh, another one that comes to mind is a more punctuated crisis response to Ebola. I wonder if you could give us a flavor of what you think the key ingredients were in those two instances that enabled uh, so much headway. They're both great examples. Um, and again, I know we'll probably get to Libya and Syria and the, and the much harder cases, but I think both are, are really um, important examples at a time when there is a lot of uh, eroding faith about whether the United States can do good in the world. I mean, it just let's face it, in both parties that sentiment, I think, has, has grown over the last uh, decade plus for a whole range of reasons that we can go into. But so on LGBT rights, just because I've already spoken about that a little bit, that really was about my concept that I, I had taken from a different domain from mass atrocities, which was that of the toolbox. What are the tools that we can employ? Um, when we employ them, are we rigorously interrogating in advance what the consequences are likely to be for the people we claim to care about? Or, as often happens, and you see this a lot, unfortunately, with the current administration, because we care about LGBT rights, do we fall prey to a kind of expressive tendency, a desire to show the world how much we care about LGBT rights in a manner that actually could make it harder for LGBT activists to make the case, which they make, of course, every day, bravely, that this is indigenous, organic, not Western, imperial, uh, Propaganda-induced, um, you know, whatever, which is what so many uh, demagoguing leaders claim about um, the LGBT communities in their societies, and so we had a ton of consultations with people who were on the front lines in the most difficult places like Uganda, and Nigeria, and so forth. And that doesn't mean that, by any means, that you like any civil society that you get some kind of there's one-stop shop and you get the consensus, you should speak out, or the consensus, you should cut off this form of support. Uh, there was always a consensus that you look again at asylum claims um, swiftly, because usually uh, somebody is, uh, in the case of, of, of many of the cases we were looking at, people were fleeing for their lives. There was always a consensus that offering legal support to people who were trying to litigate in their own countries to, to even shut down the publication of um, of periodicals that were inciting violence against gay people. So there was sort of soft stuff that there was a lot of consensus about, but on the question of whether to be private and public, again, that was something that really varied on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and what we ended up doing, and the, and the story goes all the way through to my time at the UN, uh, we also recognized that, so it isn't seen as an American, um, you know, a kind of tool of American propaganda or imperialism, to do as much of it as we can through the United Nations. And so for the first time, uh, we secured the recognition of LGBT rights as human rights under the UN as a UN norm. Uh, while I was ambassador, we brought for the first time uh, two gay men who were being pursued by ISIS uh, to the Security Council. It was the first time the Security Council in the 70 year history of the UN had ever met on the fates of gay people. And it was the surreal thing before where, where on ISIS, and we, you know, already relations with Russia were deteriorating a bit, and so Russia tended to block any human rights initiative or anything that we wanted to draw attention to, because they'd already invaded Ukraine and were already beginning to do terrible things in Syria. Um, but on this, ISIS was something, of course, Russia always wanted to cooperate on. And so when I went to the Russian ambassador, I said, if another issue, like ISIS is now pushing gay people off the top of tall buildings uh, to their deaths. They're executing them in this way, and we have, had 15 Security Council sessions in the last three months on ISIS crimes, including one, rightly, about ISIS destruction of cultural artifacts and the heritage of, of the peoples of, these, of this region. Surely, if we can focus on cultural artifacts, we can focus on live human beings who will no longer be alive because they're being targeted in this way. Anyway, the Russian ambassador said no. <laughs> uh, and so we had to do it as a kind of side meeting, but it was still the first meeting of the Security Council. And then after the Orlando Pulse shooting, I think having laid the predicate by ensuring that those men told their story before the council, and then with this 
you know, travesty and devastation that so many Americans were, were su suffering, we secured for the first time a condemnation by the Security Council, including Russia, of the targeting of people on the grounds of their sexual orientation, which this may all sound like normative, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, once the Security Council has spoken, it is something that can be seized upon uh, by people who are struggling in their own societies. And it's better to seize upon something like that than something that an American president says um, in most cases. So that's one example, and again, it's a, it's a, you know, we haven't changed the world, there's still horrific um, violence um, and legal persecution of gay people around the world, LGBT people around the world, but the, 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 you know, changing the norms, shifting the norms, creating a different set of international standards, it seems to me, was, was one of the things that we could do. Ebola, and, and I'll be brief on this, but is, is an extremely important case because it also reminds you that you don't get credit for that which you have prevented. And I don't mean credit like, oh, we want you know, that to be part of Obama's legacy, nothing like that. What I mean is once something has succeeded, it quickly retreats from people's minds, which then has bearing on whether people think the United States can do good in the world, right? So if you don't even remember um, as so many don't, I find with my own students, it's just something that sort of came and went. Um, and then we make the case that actually it's in our interest for the U.S. to lead the world and build global coalitions. Ebola is not a, doesn't even come to mind as a data point. Um, and that's one of the reasons I told the story in the book is I think that has to be corrected. But what we, what happened in September 2014 is that we were told by the CDC that there would be 1.4 million infections in West Africa, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea by January, so four or five months away. Um, Donald Trump already was beginning to tweet on Ebola, and I, I know that now he tweets on lots of things, but this ended up being, and there are studies on this, and some of you should look into this, but ended up being a really important chapter in his own political journey um, because he, tweeted you know, hundreds of times. He was on Fox News almost every day talking about Ebola and was not the only one. There were Democrats as well who were, who were I think, uh, irresponsibly, not as many uh, as on the other side of the aisle, but irresponsibly stoking fear about this and not following the science, which is what we needed to do in order to deal with the epidemic at its source. But to his credit, President Obama bucked the fear and bucked the fact that Congress did not want to support what we were doing at the outset. And what saved the people of West Africa was not, above all their own efforts and resilience and bravery because it was the scariest thing to be happening, watching your loved ones basically vanish uh, before your eyes. So first and foremost, the credit goes to them. But the other thing that happened was, thank goodness, and I will thank the heavens till the day I die on this, Congress happened to be on recess. Um, <laughs> when we were in a position of figuring out exactly the contours of the response. And had they not been, and it really, it gave us time to put in place our own forces and public, above all our public health professionals, but 2,000 US soldiers as well who built Ebola treatment units just using their logistic capacity in partnership with our public health, our CDC people and our aid workers. But we started to build that in support of local efforts I then was empowered, as was John Kerry, to go to other countries and say, okay, this is what Barack Obama's willing to do in the face of this crummy politics. What are you gonna do? The British then decided we would do Liberia, they would do Sierra Leone. The French did a less energetic job on Guinea, but nonetheless you know, took notional responsibility on Guinea, at least to be lead country. China began building Ebola treatment units. We got the Cubans to you know, provide doctors some of the best medical care. Um, that was offered, in fact, came, you know, the more, more doctors per capita than any country in the UN. But every country in the UN, Malaysia providing rubber gloves. But, but the, the reason the, asking about Ebola is so important is when people say, does the international order, does it work, does it not work, can it work, isn't it collapsing? That's what it looks like when it works. It doesn't just congeal. Like there's a collective action problem every time there's something that happens in the commons or outside of our own borders. But what happens is someone has to step up and be a kind of team captain, take a certain risk, make a certain investment, but then, and this is where Trump has a point, we have to leverage what we are doing to get others to do more as well. And the Ebola coalition response, not just the American response, in support above all of the indigenous actions 
really is a case study in how global coalitions meet threats that if they are not met at their source will inevitably come home to roost. All right. Um, along the uh, lines that you had described at the outset, one of the features of this book that I recommend to all of you is the way in which you weave your, your professional life and your personal life and the ways they intersect. Uh, and uh, in one passage that I liked very much, you educate a young idealist when your son Declan, then age six uh, years of, of age, uh, asks you why a Syrian refugee family that you had met couldn't return to their home country and rebuild their homes. And you explain that Assad would probably bomb it again. And he asks, why doesn't Obama make Assad stop? And your reply is, well, because America has been in two really hard wars over the last 15 years, and he doesn't want to start another. It's also really hard to use war to make things better and save people. Often it doesn't work. He then goes on in very precocious fashion to ask essentially if there should be a no-fly zone. So I think we've got yeah, a future he, diplomat. He basically America. said, why can't he at least stop the planes? <laughs> and I was like, that's exactly the argument I've been making in the, in the situation room. <laughs> Thank you. So the moral was, uh, uh, of, of that, of course, is, is, is uh, related to these central challenges that the Obama administration faced in Libya and in Syria. To critics, Libya is the example of the dangers of humanitarian intervention. Uh, and the undesired consequences that can flow from it. Now you argue convincingly in my view in the book that even absent uh, a Western military intervention, uh, there would have been tremendous strife in Libya. Um, but the question nonetheless exists, could there have been more done to stabilize Libya after the international intervention? What can we learn from this experience and what's still going on in Libya um, to intervene the most effectively when humanitarian need dictates in the future? Um, well, you're certainly right that Libya um, is sort of looms out there, you know, not quite with the same status as the in U.S. invasion of Iraq, but as something that I think is widely seen to have made things worse. Um, I don't fundamentally know, I don't think anybody can know what Libya would look like if Gaddafi had been able to do what he said he was intent on doing, which was to hunt down people who were loyal to the opposition house by house. Um, he had, we, there's a town called Misrata, which was a town that Gaddafi's forces bombarded really almost to the point of oblivion, which if you, if you see pictures of it, look, it looks an awful lot like Dresden, um, did after the second world war, um, uh, just rubble everywhere. I mean, there was a ruthlessness, um, and not exactly a spirit of compromise in Gaddafi that l led us to be very skeptical, um, that there was any way to avert what he was claiming he was on the verge of doing, absent going to the UN Security Council and seeing was there international support for a civilian protection operation. And again, it's very easy to forget because um, Obama certainly was at the helm of this coalition, um, but the United Nations Security Council, which had already put in place economic sanctions against Gaddafi for his killing of his people, had already referred the crimes in Libya to the International Criminal Court, but at that point when, and Obama would not have intervened had there not been a UN Security Council resolution, that was clear. Um, but when we went to the Security Council to see if there'd be support, um, it, uh, Russia and China, countries that would normally veto such a measure, uh, abstained. And the resolution went through with 10 votes in favor and five abstentions. And that's just extremely unusual. Uh, any humanitarian action of that nature by and large, Russia um, would hold uh, in, in great suspicion and would tend to, would, just through our history as, as Kosovo, East Timor, whatever, would always have been either delaying or blocking. So this was a, a testament to just how moved the whole world was by what Gaddafi was doing. It was also a testament to a very different time than the one we're in now, but where the Tunisian dictator had fled really without gunfire uh, Hosni Mubarak, the seemingly permanent leader of Egypt, had stepped down peacefully. So there was a sense then, um, maybe a hubris on the part of the of of the protesters. I don't think we felt hubris so much as what happens if Gaddafi succeeds brutally. How does that affect the rest of the region? How does it incite uh, actions by other leaders? At that point, Syria hadn't really gotten going. Um, in, you know, in the horrible path it would soon be on. So those are the factors. The Lib Libya's own ambassador to the UN actually defected 
from representing Gaddafi, and it was a very an unforgettable scene where he's in front of the placard that says Libya and says, look, the rule in the UN Charter is that the sovereign can ask for self-defense, and I am asking you on behalf of the Libyan people to protect my people from the slaughter that awaits them. And so that's the context in which uh, President Obama acted. You asked rightly about the planning or whether more could have been done, because I think in the, in the context that I've just described, it would have been very hard to walk away. Spend the Arab League, which is never for the use of US military force or Western military force, had asked us to set up safe areas uh, for civilians as well. So that was the backdrop. I think the on the planning issue, and Obama talks a lot about this being a regret of his uh, not planning properly, a huge amount of planning was done. Um, and I, I've had a back and forth with Obama since he left office to talk to him about that because I saw his answer in some interview and I said, well, let me just make sure you know what's going on in the bowels of your government. I mean, you know, plan after plan, it's li you know, the same was true in Iraq, of course, with the Iraq invasion, um, but those plans never surfaced in that instance. In our case, very alert to the failure of those plans to be relevant in the Iraq context, we were not having any difficulty getting our plans to the right people, but the Libyans themselves on the ground made very clear from the minute Gaddafi fell that they did not want an international troop presence uh, in Libya. And so when you look back, was the thing to do maybe to have asked before, you know, the Libyan ambassador saying, come help, come help. And the Arab League saying, you better go rescue and you know, not fail Arabs again like you always do. They're yelling at us to do something. Even the Russians are willing to let this go through. Was that the time to say, well, what about the aftermath? Will there be, you know, would you? But it's hard to do that because you never know what the aftermath is gonna look like. And so there was a lot of planning, but it was on an assumption that they would want our help on the back end, more help than, than they proved, or at least more, in-person help than, than they wanted. And then, the, but the other dimension is, you know, when a leader falls and is brutally murdered as Gaddafi was by the opposition, I mean, you know, some people, you know, I think we're, we're so relieved that it was over and that Gaddafi was gone and that the next phase of Libya's development could proceed. I tell the story in the book of, of even Declan, my son, who for months I'd been you know, at the White House 24-7, and, and he started running around the apartment saying, Cough. this was actually before he was killed, but w when he just left uh, Tripoli, and my son ran around the apartment, he was then, you know, two or three, but just saying, coffee is gone, coffee is gone, no more coffee, because for him it meant, mommy's back, you know, like, I might come home. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but when Gaddafi was killed, you know, that was when it became very clear that uh, it, I mean, or at least looked quite likely that this was going to be an extremely contested and bloody aftermath. And it, you know, there, it, actually they had a free election and it remained pretty stable for a while, but then of course it has plummeted. And what I'd say is, was there more diplomacy that could have been done while the bombing was going on and the civilian, we were seeking to protect civilians and fulfill the terms of the UN mandate, was there some huge diplomatic push where Gaddafi could have been convinced to take a golden parachute out of his country for the sake of an evolutionary pacted transition where he would get to be reunited with his wealth and you know live out his life much as the Tunisian dictator did until recently until he died recently we launched that diplomacy don't get me wrong but i just could it have been at a different level of intensity um, sort of almost not taking no for an answer was there a way to rally african countries with us, I think that could have gotten a lot more attention than it did, and that's a big regret, I think, that we should have. I, but on the, on the decision as to whether to protect the civilians or not, I think that's a much harder call. Because see Syria today, Syria is an example, again, where we stand back and, and it's easy, a lot of people say Obama let X number of Syrians die, but, but the Syrians are protesting and uh, taking matters into their own hands as well themselves. Sometimes I feel our debate negates the agency of the of the people on the ground and the same people who criticize us for going into Libya you, you know criticize us for not going into Syria and what I try to do in the book is bring you into these debates and make as vivid and real as possible what you know what little you know um, and what you're trying to achieve 
as well as the, the global dynamics that you're grappling with at the same time, um, including Russia and its ever-evolving relationship with, um, with the Middle East, but also with the truth, <laughs> which yeah. changes a lot over the course of the life of my time in the government. Sure. On, on Syria, you just alluded to the fact that there's, there's a debate, and you, you express this tension uh, uh, in the book, between sort of consequentialism and, and, and principles uh, that would mandate intervention in some contexts. Uh, right during the midst of the red line crisis in which Assad had used chemical weapons, uh, you gave a, an address on the topic and you expressed your understanding of people's fears, another possible Middle Eastern quagmire, possible inadvertent strengthening of ISIS, sucking the United States into an unwanted role of global policemen. Uh, but you come down at the end with a, uh, uh, with the following statement, we should agree that there are lines in this world that cannot be crossed and limits on murderous behavior, especially with weapons of mass destruction that must be enforced. And the question is whether this is essentially a trump card against consequentialism. We don't say trump cases. card anymore in my house. <laughs> <laughs> whether this is a winning hand against <laughs> consequentialism. Um, are there ca or are there cases in which we we simply can't reach rights violations uh, because of the, the expected adverse consequences? Well, the argument I was making was consequentialist. So it was not, um, it may have had some flowery language in it, but it was not some kind of Kantian categorical imperative. It was, what would it mean if a leader can gas 1,400 people, including 400 children, as it happens, at will, after the President of the United States, has announced that there's a red line. I was not part of those uh, deliberations. I think that was a pretty spontaneous articulation of the U.S. position. The U.S. position had been don't use chemical weapons, but President Obama, um, in an ad hoc exchange with Chuck Todd, gave the more flowery and memorable version of the, of the uh, statement of U.S. principle. Um, but I, like President Obama, like so many, was of the view that if that genie's out of the bottle, um, it's not just the Syrian people who are going to be harmed uh, by the weakening or the evis evisceration of a norm that had held um, largely for much of the previous century, but there had been use by Saddam Hussein, of course, in, in 1988, so it had held exclusively, thoroughly, for 25 years. And um, the thoughts are, of course, U.S. forces... Uh, who are in battle elsewhere in the region, um, as they were, uh, you know, just coming out of Iraq. They would soon be back in Iraq because of ISIS. But in Afghanistan, uh, our allies in the region, um, and how they would fare if chemical weapons were suddenly becoming a kind of quasi-conventional weapon of war, which is what Assad was turning it into. And then there's a larger question, which is that the chemical weapons were giving rise to the largest or the most concentrated popul I don't write about this in the book, but the most concentrated population flights, because in a way they cause more terror than the terror they inflicted. If you got if you heard a helicopter and you thought that a chemical weapon a chemical, chemical weapons attack was coming, the odds that you were you know, off to the races and you know not around uh, were much higher, and you saw these huge waves of civilians crossing into neighboring countries, and that was already at a time when the neighboring countries were, um, you know, sheltering, in the case of Jordan and Turkey and Lebanon, you know, more than a million people uh, in each place. And so, you know, I, I wish I could say that in my argument I'd said, hey, if we don't deal with these precipitating triggers for people's flight, I don't wish I'd said this, but I, what I did not say, but what proved to be true mm -hmm. is uh, the countries surrounding Syria will not be able to sustain the generosity that they have shown. At some point, the people in these countries will flee further afield. That will have an impact on a future vote that we weren't even thinking about in the United Kingdom about whether the United Kingdom should leave the European Union. That will have an impact on European politics shifting them rightward and in a much, whatever about right-left, in a much more xenophobic direction. In other words, what seems like it's sort of contained here in a, in a heartbreaking, wrenching, um, devastating war for the Syrian people, you know, has all of these other, other consequences. And, you know, luckily, even though President Obama didn't use force, 
having, he decided to go to Congress. Congress didn't support the use of force, very reflective of where the American people were, by the way. I mean, I think not out of step with where the country was, but we did manage to dismantle 1,300 tons of Assad's chemical weapons and destroy the mixing sites and all of that, and that was something I negotiated my first month in the job, um, which proved useful because then when ISIS, a year later, would set up its quasi-caliphate, that was at least one weapon that it wasn't able to get access to as it overran various uh, Syrian facilities. So again, I, there's no clean way to look back on this. I, I, with no dogmatism do I say, you know, President Obama, you know, if he'd only done this, we wouldn't have Brexit, we wouldn't have Trump, we, you know, we'd have a peaceful Syria. But what I do think is telling the world we were gonna do a certain thi thing, excuse me, and then pulling back I felt in the wake of that an erosion of our, our kind of mojo, you know, like I, you could just feel people thinking President Obama really, he wants to bring the troops home. They were right about that and he was right to want to do that. But who, if anybody tests him, who is going to challenge those individuals? And so it may be that a little more smoke and mirrors, a little less transparency about um, our fatigue would have been good, all things considered, in terms of deterrence and and incentives and disincentives in the international system. But again, it's hugely complex. Okay. I have one more question for you, and then we're going to be turning over to audience questions. And it's on another theme that pervades the book, which is the importance of other people in the course of your career. You use the, the term lean on as a kind of counterpart to Sheryl Sandberg's idea of leaning in. And um, when you were... <clears throat> When you and your mother were moving to Pittsburgh, uh, and you were about nine years old, at exactly the same time, I lived on the other side of Pennsylvania, and there was a charismatic and principled high school kid who lived down the street from me who played a great role in mentoring me, teaching me to play the same sports that you were learning across the state. His name's John Prendergast, and John is, uh, John is, is well known for his role in say, the Save Darfur movement. He later became someone who was a professional and, and colleague of yours and a lifelong friend. He, he's featured as one of the, the numerous people in the book who were so important to, uh, to, your, to your career development, your personal development. You mentioned some groups of women who worked with you as journalists in Bosnia or in the NSC at times when you were juggling a, a million things with a young family and tremendous responsibility. Um, obviously, you talk a lot about your family, including Cass and your, uh, your mother and stepdad and others. I'd just like to give you a chance to, to share some advice with students as they move forward about how to think of this concept of leaning on um, and how they might use it usefully in developing their own careers in, in foreign affairs. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I, um, I, in, in many ways, you know, in coming to this country as an immigrant, I came with my mother and my younger brother, and then my mother met up with my now stepfather, who was also coming over from Ireland, because there was no divorce in Ireland, so that's in, on one level why they had to come here in order to be, be together. So it was two, two Dublin uh, men and women coming together with me and my younger brother, and um, in some ways my story is about kind of building an extended family, um, uh, you know, person by person. Um, and you mentioned John. I wasn't sure where you were going with that, John, <laughs> John Prendergast, but uh, John was the best man at my wedding. He's the godfather to my son, Declan, um, and uh, ends up being so important to me. I met him, as you note, over the Darfur atrocities, but he became so much more than that. Uh, my book is definitely unique in the political memoir domain in combining ample discussion of romance with um, a sort of darker discussion of Putin. Uh, and, and, uh, but with no connection between the two, I assure you. Um, but I mention that because John in my, uh, you know, this, and this is just one example as, you, as you've offered as well, but you know, when I was in, at low points and where I was so focused on my career and neglecting my personal life in, um, or making very bad choices in my personal life, there was always John. And so yes, we were working on Darfur, but then there was John. And he gives me the concept that uh, a number of young women especially have, have really latched onto of the Bat Cave. So the Bat Cave you may know from Bruce Wayne, but the Bat Cave is also my head and John's head. And when you're, uh, you know, about to embark on a big decision, the bats can come out and distract you and you stay up all night and you're not sure what to do and you can rethink your decision. And 
So John gave me the back game. And my dad had been an alcoholic when I was younger. John's dad had been an alcoholic. And so after a bad breakup, John took me to Al-Anon meetings, which are for the children of alcoholics. And it was like a revelation to me, some of the things that I'd been doing that were uh, compensatory, I guess, in some ways for, for some of the things that had happened in my childhood. Anyway, all of this is in the book, as well as Libya, Syria, and the rest. Go figure. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the concept of, I love that. And it, Lean On, I didn't get, that's not mine. I wish I could claim uh, the, the coining of, of, of that idea in the, in the context of, of uh, the juggle of life. But actually... Uh, it was Secretary Clinton who, uh, after she, she was no longer Secretary of State, I guess she was already running for president, and I ran into her, and she said, how's it going? And I said, well, you know, they talk about lean in, but I, this is when I was at the UN. I had two small children. I was, like, nursing. At the same time, I'm talking to Secretary General, and then John Kerry calls, and he hears me nursing, and it's like the whole... It just, I felt like those scenes were playing out every day, and so the time I saw her... I said, well, it's not so much lean in, it's kind of fall down. It's feeling kind of like fall down right now. And she said, nah, she says, not lean in, it's lean on. And um, I even have in the, in the photo sections of my books, I have little photos of people who, who, are, who are, again, these characters in the book who I picked up along the way, one in Bosnia, one in law school, John, and they're photos of them with my children. You know, one riding a slide in Central Park, you know, another reading to my children, John taking... Declan to a Washington Nationals game. Um, and that's what it looks like, right? I mean, there is, there's no way I could have dreamed of operating at that level uh, in national security. There's no, no way that most mortals can do their jobs at the highest levels that they seek to do them at without that kind of network. And I spent a lot of time, last thing I'll say, um, talking also about our nanny Maria Castro, who I helped naturalize, um, but just presided over her naturalization ceremony when she became American, but she was from Mexico, and she's lived her whole life into her 30s in Mexico. And my kids to this day say they're Hail Marys and they're Our Fathers in Spanish, because uh, <laughs> she taught them, I mean, she was so the constant in their lives as I was getting, you know, whipsawed around the world. And, and too often, I think, reflections on one's own life neglect these, these formative characters without whom, um, you know, a book like this, uh, a life like this certainly could never, could never have come together. So, so the, you know, I try, I try to do justice where justice is due, but they're also, you know, a pack of incredibly interesting and humane characters. Um, and so, but I, th I think they will, I hope they would remind readers of the different people in our, in our lives that we, that we are each depending on and sometimes maybe taking for granted. Wonderful. We're going to turn now to some questions from the audience, and Mariana and Brooke can introduce themselves and lead us off. Thank you so much for being here today, Ambassador Power. It's really an honor to have you here. My name is Mariana Smith. I'm a first year MPP student, and I'm part of the inaugural cohort of Wiser Diplomacy Fellows. Prior to coming to the Ford School, I ran a Model UN program in India. Um, and after graduating from Ford, I have a job as a Foreign Service Officer with USAID. Oh, great. By the way, I hadn't thought of how like the wiser name lends itself, like to be able to say, hi, I'm a wiser fellow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not one of those other shots. I'm, I'm wiser. I am a wiser fellow. There's that, I know, but that's not how you hear it necessarily. Here Go I ahead. thought she was just wiser than I was. But. <laughs> exactly. Hi, my name is Brooke Bossigal. I'm a senior undergraduate student at the Ford School, and I'm focusing in uh, conflict stabilization and peace building. And I've also interned with the State Department, so kind of on the foreign policy track as well. Um, sure. Um, so I'm going to ask a personal question first, and then we'll go into the other questions. You're such a powerful storyteller, um, and you, in your book you talk about the Free the 20 campaign and the Rainbow Crosswalk on First Ave. Um, how do you take a concept of a story and actually use it to pursue a policy agenda? Um, is that your question, or is that That's one of the questions? Question. That's a great yes. question. And so you read the book? <laughs> I, prefer, I actually prefer I started to, I skimmed it. Uh, <laughs> just for the record, for, for the book signing later, just if, if we have to choose between unsatisfying responses to my desperate need for affirmation. Uh, 
<laughs> but the, uh, so I started is better than I skipped it. But um, so, but you point to a couple really good examples of that, and they're a little deeper in the book. So I, you, you um, uh, chose some highlights. I mean, let me start with the free, the, let me just touch on the free the 20 campaign, because I think it's a great example. Um, of a larger proposition. So one of the parts of my education is to believe that we need to uh, shrink the change, is the expression I use. It's not, again, original to me. Um, there's a great book called Switch by the Heath Brothers. I recommend, I think the subtitle is like making change when change is hard. And their idea is while the problems in the world are so big, burning planet and 70 million displaced people and you name it, that the solutions are not commensurably big. That I mean, eventually they might be, but that fundamentally we need to each shrink the change that we seek, and then over time those will aggregate. They may even snowball into something very large, um, but that we can get stuck in a doom loop if we think we need to find a commensurately large solution to the kinds of large problems that we see. So that's their idea. I um, became very drawn to it when I was in government because even in government at the highest levels, you could get very demoralized just thinking, I mean, how am I gonna deal with the human rights recession in the world? You know, 13 straight years where freedom has declined, and that's when Barack Obama's president. Um, you know, what are we gonna do about the way that rule of law is giving way to rule by law, where, where governments are increasingly using their laws to crack down on civil society and religious freedom? And, and so I'm waking up in the morning and just thinking, oh, like the planet's going to hell. Um, and you know my temptation, I have a choice. I can watch the rerun of Baseball Tonight in the morning, which is what I'm tempted to do, uh, or I can get out of bed and just say, okay, what are we gonna do? And so I sat down with my team and said, we have to do something about the freedom recession, but it has to be manageable. It has to be something where conceivably at the end of it, we could feel uh, a dividend, that we could have done something for someone. And so that is the conversation that with my young whippersnapper uh, diplomats who are experts on social media, we came up with a political, with a, with a campaign called hashtag free the 20. And it was very modest, but it was just about using my profile, the support of the US government, the windows of the US UN lobby, which is right across the street from the UN, to hang over 20 days, the portraits of 20 female political prisoners around the world. Not just from Venezuela and Syria and countries that we were always kind of at loggerheads with, but also Egypt, China, you know, country, very powerful countries that we needed to have strong relations with where our ambassadors, US ambassadors in those countries were a bit apprehensive about the nature of the campaign. And the idea here was not that even if we succeeded that that, that would change the world or deal with the freedom recession, no chance but it was that actually exposing these women would draw attention to the larger systemic injustices in these societies that would, if, if nothing else, it would give some consolation and solace to their families because many of these women have been in jail for a long time. But lo and behold, the combination of telling their stories, back to your question, on social media in as gripping a way as I can, but stay, making sure everything was fact-checked and rigorous, um, getting the actually bipartisan support of 20 US women senators in the US Senate, there happened to be 20 at the time. Uh, and the, the first I approached was Kelly Ayotte from New Hampshire, Republican from New Hampshire, and then she helped bring the others along. Um, but we were able collectively, in c conjunction with what the lawyers and family members were doing, to get 16 of the 20 women out of jail. 16. Now, compared to the human rights recession, that's nothing, but each of those voices are then voices that go back to their society and have the chance to advocate on behalf of other uh, political prisoners or the issues that they were campaigning against in the first place, which in the case of the Chinese prisoners was sexual harassment. They'd been locked up because of protesting sexual harassment. In one case, it was environmental pollution. Another it was corruption. And so their voices matter intrinsically, but it was also an example, I think, of telling a story in a manner that was easier for people to process and relate to and rally behind. And actually the very fact that it was small and modest made people feel, okay, this we can do. You tell me we're gonna fix the human rights recession, forget about it, like that's, that's beyond my pay grade, you know? And so I think that's, that's one, one good example. And, and, but the story and telling it and make sure, making sure that these individuals become vivid for the people that you're speaking to rather than just a name and a, and a kind of, you know, 
uh, two sentence description of, of what they did. I mean, everybody's heard that. That's in the that's in the newspaper every day. But to to paint the portrait of who are their children, who are their parents, you know, where were they teaching before this happened? What do they write? Um, you know, it just made it a thicker a thicker portrait, and I think harder for people to look away. Hi. So I also have a personal question. Um, we began talking about successes. So on the flip side, I'll ask about failures. But um, so we began this discussion with a mistake. Cass's email, your email, bad dates. All of us can relate to that. I know I can. <laughs> um, but what we can't relate to is mistakes that are made when the stakes are a lot higher. So mistakes when managing mass atrocity. And I was curious as to what you consider within your professional um, career to be one of your greatest mistakes, how you manage that, and how you manage to move forward. Um. Well, we, we talked a little bit about the red line, so I'll just give a, br a brief answer there. I mean, I think, um, so without getting into all the details again, President Obama decided to stage, having issued the red line threat, Assad had crossed the red line multiple times in small ways prior to the very big attack. That's often forgotten, but there were a bunch of other attacks to which we didn't respond in an, in an overt way. So then the big attack comes, and he says, I'm going to stage these limited military strikes. I was left confident, partly because our military was not at all enthusiastic in general, rightly, I think, about getting entangled in Syria, so it wasn't like they were chomping to, but I was convinced that the plan was manageable, was limited, and would deter uh, Assad from f further use. And even though that wasn't gonna solve the Syria problem, I thought maybe we could kickstart some diplomacy on the heels of that, and even to take one monstrous weapon out of his hand, I thought was better than you know what we do on, on most days when it came to Syria. So my view was that the president's course was the right course. He then, um, and it's a, a, a story I tell in the book, so I won't belabor it, but um, a few days passed between the time he made that decision and the time the targets were ready. And again, the idea to kill no civilians, to harm no civilians, to make sure that these are that you don't hit the chemicals themselves, which would cause a plume and and hurt more people, and so it was, a, you know, it was a hard to do this limited thing, but I, you know, I think everybody was left confident that we were in a position to do it. And um, with the passage of time, the skepticism in the United States and globally about whether this was a good idea began to grow, and the memories of what Assad had done to his people began to fade. And that was the context in which President Obama decided on a Friday night uh, on the eve of the day that he was going to be using military force for the first time in Syria against just a, s a select number of targets. But that was the uh, night he decided to go to Congress instead. And he um, told us he was gonna do that. Uh, I had just <coughs> come through Senate confirmation and I managed to become UN ambassador despite writing a million words that were a very large share of which were very critical of the U.S. government, so I wasn't sure I would get through confirmation, but somehow I got through confirmation, but I'd only been in my job for uh, less than a month. And when he said he was going to Congress, I had a couple reactions. One, this is so the right thing. Like, how is it possible that we are using military force as often as we are, We and by we, I don't mean the Obama administration, I mean just generally since 9-11 in so many places, without a domestic debate, without congressional support, where our fam military families are bearing this burden alone, and, and most of our country doesn't even know where half of them are. You know, that nobody knew that the, we had soldiers doing counterterrorism in Mali until it blew up. So part of me thought that, um, but another part of me thought there is no way this is going to work because basically my experience of having gone through confirmation was that so much of the debate on Capitol Hill was not at the level anymore. And, and while it was true that many Republicans, you know, they were in the opposition party, and so in a sense that's where you would first look to, to, to wonder would there be support from them, but many of them had called for military action in the wake of the strikes. But I just thought as soon as President Obama's for it, that may change their calculus. And the truth is, not without reason, because their constituents, just like Democratic constituents, are really nervous about another war. And it's, you know, the sectarian dynamics are similar to those in Iraq, you know, lots in Syria is different, but same region, you know, neighbors. So people just, like we were saying, limited, you know, I mean, literally a, a matter of 48 hours, probably this operation would have, it was just meant to do a version of what President Trump actually did, which is just deter the use of, of uh, 
uh, the deter sarin attacks. And, um, but anyway, so he decides he's gonna do it, and this second impulse was very, very loud in me, in the meeting in which he said he was gonna do it. And in the meeting with me were John Kerry, Chuck Hagel, Joe Biden, who had a combined 76 years of legislative experience. And then there was me who thought, Congress is never gonna go along with this, but these individuals who actually knew the members who comprised the Congress sort of were themselves torn, but ultimately came around to saying we can do this. Israel was very supportive of carrying out these strikes. A lot of the really powerful, effective lobbying groups in Washington had already made clear they wanted to see a, a punitive response, but I did not raise my voice in this meeting. I deferred. I basically said, okay, here's my bailiwick. I'm the person mobilizing the global coalition. Um, and convincing people that the evidence on which we're acting is accurate and not a reprise of the Iraq war scenario. That's my job. Um, I will raise a question in this meeting about what happens if Congress doesn't go along, like is our chemical weapons about to become a conventional weapon of war again, and, and can we think that through before we go to Congress? But for me, on the narrow issue of legislative feasibility, I did not raise my voice and say, Mr. Mr. President, I think, I think this is crazy. I think the Republicans are gonna to wanna to do the opposite of what you want and Democrats and Republicans alike are, are skeptical of war. This isn't gonna work. And I wish I'd said that. I don't think it would have made a difference. I think he was very uh, hell-bent on going to Congress for, for the right reason, right? Um, and he was also very confident we would get the votes, not just because of these three individuals, but because of, again, the support we had from such close allies like Israel. Um, so, it, so I think it was damaging to us to have, there's the red line and then not responding to the red line is how this normally gets understood, but, but to have announced already earlier that week that we had this military operation planned and then to show the world that we couldn't mobilize support from either party um, had the effect, I think, of weakening his commander in chief authority going forward. Um, we'll now move on to audience questions. Researchers are encouraged and expected to be unbiased, yet research on violence warrants advocacy. How do we balance advocacy and knowledge production? That's a great question. Um, I don't, there are probably people in this room who've thought more about that than I have. I guess I would say um, that, you know, inevitably in most research, there is a thesis that someone goes into, um, it goes into their research with, right, some kind of proposition or hypothesis. And where it gets very dangerous is, and that, and that proposition may have, um, you know, a, an, an activist soul behind it or an activist motivation behind it. So for example, I'll give you, I'll give you an example of a proposition I have right now, which is, um, but that I don't have the evidence for yet, um, which is, um, you know, I believe that the sort of demagogue, authoritarian, nationalist surge in democracies is going to crest and fade um, because I believe that the individuals who would centralize power around themselves and who in large measure care mainly about themselves but are taking advantage of others' economic misfortune and demagoguing immigrants and, and other issues, I believe that their inability to deliver for their citizens will hurt them electorally for as long as, again, they're operating in democratic climates. And some of them want to take the democratic rules away as soon as they're in office, but, but in, that, in the set of circumstances where that's not the case. So I, that's my hypothesis. Um, so, and my activist soul, wants that to be true, because I don't want right-wing, populist, xenophobic governments that would infringe the rights of minorities to thrive in the way that they feel they are thriving now. So, um, but as I embark on that, which may be one of my next projects after I finish um, talking far too much about myself <laughs> over the coming weeks, um, I, uh, I have to, I have to, play it straight, it has to be about the data and about what, what are they delivering? And you know, is it actually the case that the Prime Minister, is the Prime Minister or President Orban of Hungary, um, maybe he's doing more on healthcare and social services than I ever thought possible. You know, maybe yes, he's excluding 
the Roma and you know maybe he's invoking anti-Semitic tropes to sustain his own power, but maybe he's got the economy zooming in a way that has brought jobs back. And so to me, you know, I don't want that to be true. I want him to be failing because I want my thesis to be true because I want to have hope and reason to believe. But God forbid if I'm doing my research that I let my wants get in the way of the facts as I, as I confront them. And, and I'm making it seem like a clear distinction. Uh, people cherry pick facts unwittingly all the time. But I'm luckily married to a behavioral <laughs> scientist who's constantly reminding me of these dangers. And so, you know, just making sure that, as I did for this book even, I mean, this is a memoir, and I had a team of, you know, 15 fact checkers, uh, you know, going over everything just because, just because my memory is this, or I think it was this way. I mean, you, ju you, know, you just have to, in a, you know, in a sort of this world where facts are in disrepute for no good reason, the last thing you want to do is give anybody, do anybody the favor of, um, of presenting something that isn't fully cooked and that isn't based on data, science, facts, et cetera. So you just mentioned the rise of right-wing nationalism and populism. Uh, so we have a question from Twitter asking, given the rise of, they specify, Trumpism, is there still a role for di diplomacy and what does that look like? Definitely. I mean, there is a role for diplomacy today. Um, for starters, there's a role for other countries who have relied on the United States for many uh, decades and got used to the United States being the team captain, as I described in the Ebola example, but also you could look at the Iran nuclear deal or the Paris Agreement. Those are all examples of US leaders taking the initiative and then mobilizing coalitions. Same with the anti-ISIS coalition. But now that US leadership and, uh, is in retreat uh, and, and that we are often not shaping uh, outcomes, I think, in the interest of our own people, we are ripping up agreements but not making it all clear to anybody what we would replace them with. Um, and believe me, a lot of those agreements are imperfect. Um, and if anybody could find a way to you know, extend, for example, the life of the Iran nuclear deal an extra 10 years, um, you know, that would be a good thing for the world. Or if anybody could find a way to get Iran to shut down its ballistic missile program, that would be a good thing for the world. Um, but I think it's really important to know also where your leverage comes from, the extent of your leverage, which is sometimes underestimated, but also, in some cases, the limits of your leverage. And what the current administration has done is dramatically limited and shrunk the amount of leverage the United States has to get what it wants by being seen to unjustly have ripped up agreements that were being complied with. So what does that mean? That leaves a space, I think, for other countries to be carrying out diplomacy. Um, other countries trying to salvage the Iran nuclear deal. Other countries to be pushing forward to press China and India to make, not, a, not just to meet their Paris commitments, but to make a new set of commitments, because it was always clear that the Paris agreement was just a floor. And China and India would like nothing more than to point to our abdication from the Paris Agreement as grounds for not making new commitments. Um, but that's not gonna serve their pro people well any more than it's gonna serve Americans or, or other people around the world. So, so there's space for much more creative and, and multi-pronged diplomacy, you know, no longer waiting for, for the US to catalyze a coalition, but um, uh, sort of unlikely suspects to step forward. You see a little bit of that happening now. Um, Sweden getting involved in the Yemen crisis, Turkey and Russia, although you know it's falling apart, but the Idlib, the temporary pause in the fighting in Idlib, there's some examples like that. Um, and then in our own country, there's plenty of, plenty of grounds to rebuild our diplomatic corps and appeal to young people to go into the Foreign Service to know that this, is, that this neglect of diplomacy and expertise is temporary you know, my own desire would be be very temporary, but um, but we know it's finite no matter what, unless you know we see some kind of effort to change the constitution altogether. Um, and so uh, so this is finite, and we need. There has been such a hemorrhaging of talent uh, at just the time we need diplomacy most. I mean, your average refugee today is displaced for more than twenty years. You know, in the old days it was seven or eight years, and that's one of the reasons we have so many displaced. It's not just that we have more conflict, it's that conflicts aren't ending. How do you end conflicts? Through diplomacy, conflict resolution. How do you do that? You need to have talented people who invest themselves in the substance of these places. And right now, that's not what's being rewarded. Um, uh, and that's not what's being invested in, in other countries as well sufficiently. 
That was a perfect transition to our final question. As two women intending to pursue careers in the Foreign Service, what advice would you give to us or others in our same position? Well, first of all, I, I congratulate you on not being deterred by the exit of so many foreign servants, as I think I said to, to one of you earlier. Um, this is actually a great time to apply for the Foreign Service. Uh, <laughs> The acceptance ratio is going to be much higher because uh, they're just, you know, a lot of people are leaving, a lot of vacancies, um, so you can view it as an opportunity. Um, but in general, you know, I find, and maybe I can just broaden it because there are many people in the audience and many students in the audience who are, may, may not go in that, uh, may not be pursuing that walk of life, but may be interested in service of a different kind. But I think, you know, he, he or she who fights every battle fights none. And so figuring out what your slice of change is, what your, if you're going in the foreign service, your regional expertise that you're most interested in acquiring or your functional expertise on cyber threats or on sanctions or on free, tra free and fair trade, um, whatever your slice of it is, you know, don't be afraid. I, I, I find some of my students afraid to kind of burrow in something, because there, there's like, what am I gonna miss? And there'll be some other opportunity there. But it turns out the art of burrowing leaves you with a knowledge of how to burrow, you know, the practice of that, and then you just be amazed at how dotted lines you never thought would exist between some area of mini specialization and how you end up later in a completely on a completely different career path or in a different uh, posting or working on homelessness back in your where you grew up or whatever, you know, your career will change so many times, but how you'll come back to something that seemed narrow at the time, you know. Um, and I have in the book, uh, you know, a great, I, something that really served me well over the years, which is what I call the X test. And I would say to myself, and this I, I said to myself before I went and left Harvard to go work for a first-term senator named Barack Obama, I did not think he was going to go be president, as I said, but I just asked myself, in effect, What's the, what's the worst that, that will come out of this? Okay, like I'll fall flat on my face, I'll be marginalized in his Senate office, but if all I learn, if all that comes out of this is X, you know, and you figure out what your X is, will it have been worth it? Will it have been worth that? And for me, it wasn't like, I'll end up UN about, you know, I wasn't even in a million years, it would have never dawned on me. It was literally like, I teach American foreign policy, if all that comes out of spending a year with Barack Obama in his Senate office is that I learn better how the Senate Foreign Relations Committee does or doesn't hold the executive branch accountable when it comes to the making of foreign policy, that actually, you know, it's a small bit of knowledge, but that's more than I'm going to learn if I just keep teaching the same course, maybe. And and um, and so just defining, just just. Be, you know, trying to be intentional before whatever you do, again, domestic service, the corporate sector, you know, being a lawyer of some kind, you know, if, if all, if you're in legal defense, you know, there's a thousand reasons, oh, I gotta, how am I gonna pay back my, do, my, my loans? How am I gonna pay that back? And then you say to yourself, okay, well, what do I balance that again? Well, if all I do is help five people, you know, get a fair shake in, you know, a pretty lopsided justice system, Will it have been worth it? Um, especially if eventually I'll go and I'll earn the money I need to pay back my, my loans and so forth. And, and so just defining it, I think, in those terms, rather than sometimes we get a little grandiose about, about all we can achieve, and, and you'll get there. But I think if each step is a kind of growth, if you can identify the minimum growth you can achieve, then, then all kinds of good things can happen. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.